Join me, Mark Windows, with Tony Hurst for Windows on the World Live every Sunday, 9 to 11 p.m. GMT at autonomousmedia.net. In the first hour, we'll have Mark Windows with us. And Mark hasn't been with us a bit lately, but I'll tell you, I think his once a month visits with us are going to be exceptionally powerful. And I know we're going to have a bit of a debate tonight over certain things, it seems, uh, just given the general attitude of things that I've heard coming from Mark lately. And uh, I think that there is some things to be discussed and not the least of which is the fact that uh, he actually predicted on this show something that is emerging in the U.S. now, despite the fact that he's been nowhere near the United States lately that I know of. Anyway. Absolutely not, Chuck. No, I haven't. And um, <laughs> good evening to everybody who's listening there and everywhere. Mm, absolutely. And in the second hour, we'll have Larry Woods with us and the conversation will change gears there. I promise you, I'm going to get into some subjects with Larry that have been itching at the uh, inner part of my skull lately regarding the electromagnetic fields, which are arrayed against us in so many different places. Uh, and, and here we go. It's going to sound like crazy conspiracy theory, but let's bring in somebody who is experienced with these things, a uh, you know master journeyman electrician and all that kind of good stuff to tell us all about what he has had to unlearn and relearn and discover about the electromagnetic world. Anyway, back to it. Mark, you are here with me in this first hour, and man, oh man, do we have a lot of things we could cover, but let's begin where the controversy has been as of late on this side of the Atlantic. Uh, Antifa, my friend, Antifa. Oh, my. Even the president used that phrase, right? <laughs> uh, uh, the media has definitely picked up on it. We had the right-wing Nazi white supremacist, blah, 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 rhetoric coming out. And what was the answer? Antifa. And all of a sudden, my friend, anarchists somehow had a memo that I missed that went out, and uh, they have uniforms now. They have T-shirts printed up. They're uh, masking their faces, showing up, and... Sounds exactly like what you said I was going to see very soon here in the streets of the artist formerly known as America. When you describe the very same type of people, I kid you guys not, by the way, if you think this is an American issue. <laughs> it's a Go global look issue, at, Chuck. Yeah. But, but here's the funny part. Both sides of that equation are controlled, but yet – the massive amount of the crowd that might, you know, the, 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 the general mass of the crowd is not made up of paid agents. It's not. But the dangerous end of, of this game is made up of something. And you called them change agents. And I think it doesn't matter what stripes they're wearing or what agenda they're pushing. They're there to do the very same thing. They're all working toward the same goal. And, um, you know, first of all, Let's get into what it is. I mean, are, are you guys still uh, kind of uh, bereft, you know, being uh, overrun with these guys over there in different places, uh, different demonstrations still coming up where, again, suddenly anarchists have uniforms? Is that still happening there or, you know, because I've lost track of it lately? Well, originally, I think we talked about these agent provocateurs with anarchy signs that turn up. And what happened here years ago was an anarchy sign would appear just as the television went live to the riot or the demonstration, which was shortly going to be shut down. And, of course, the anarchists were covering their faces because they were wearing police shoes. You know, I mean, it is ridiculous. But what, with Antifa, it's a different thing because they're just useful idiots. And they are largely mentored into the program, which they are now enforcing on everybody who is not part of globalism or what, call it what you want, the new world order, call it what you want, communism, whatever, whichever takes your fancy, because we are in the post-truth world now, Chuck. Well, what's interesting is, and, and, and here's where we're going to have a little bit of a debate. Um, there are people that I know that are being sucked into this and they're not being sucked into this because they've been brought into a formal agenda. They're being collected um, as the antithesis, as the opposition uh, to something else. Absolutely. And what it is, is that these are people that legitimately uh, want to make a point, some of them. 
Um, and they're being pulled into it. Now, these are not the people that are running around with the masks and the T-shirts like I was talking about. Well, but we they're have to be careful we're talking about here, Chuck, because right. this sort of fake anarchist thing is all part of Anonymous as well here. When they have the million man masked march, a loads of these idiots turn up and start having to go at the police because they are the police. Um, but the point is, this Antifa mob are something quite different. We have encountered them here, but not quite in the way you're describing. It's not not like in Charlottesville or anything like that. It's here. It's more comedic, and I'll tell you why. Because we've done several shows on this group of old age pensioners. I kid you not, who have been targeted by Antifa thugs and an organisation that we've talked about, Chuck, called Hope Not Hate. Well, they define anything that isn't part of their new world order Blairite globalist garbage as hate and this is where it gets interesting because what we're seeing now is this alt-right this alt-right thing was brought in and people who were very decent and they were maybe so they were even oh, heaven forbid Chuck they might have been slightly patriotic to their own country but not racist are now being branded as Nazis. And this was exactly where it was meant to go. It's a total ridiculous situation. It's a post-truth world. And what's coming out of the media with this is laughable. But we have these organisations here who are pushing it. And they're pushing it through lobbyists. And we've been through the whole thing. It's a huge spider's web of subversion. But what we're seeing here is a cartoon version of what you've got there because we're seeing here old age pensioners being shut down by masked thugs and we did go into this several weeks ago and it's now got even more ridiculous because this group who was started at the tea rooms in harrods in piccadilly a group of elderly intellectuals they may not have been quite as el quite as elderly as they are now at the time of formation because it was a long time ago. But the point <laughs> is that they were putting on a meeting in London with a guy who wrote a play about the death of Princess Diana. And Antifa thugs and an agent of the state known as Jez Turner, who parades himself as an alt-right um, kind of patriot stroke extremist, really. Um, he's always at the back shouting things to get people going. Agent provocateur. Well, what he did was he sent an email, and I got one of these emails because he sent it to me, that the meeting was about Mossad killing Princess Diana, which had nothing to do with what the meeting was about. So these <laughs> useful idiots, right, these absolute morons and retards, and I don't mind using the word retards, because I got, I got pulled up for it the other day, but I'm not politically correct, and I'm never going to be politically correct, and um, if people have a problem with me calling them, with, with me calling for retards then let's have a real debate on it you know and oh no li listen on, on <laughs> this on this show mark on this show mark i i absolutely <laughs> reserve the right to use the word retard as well so believe me if, if it's called for it's called for and by the way i would never call someone who is legitimately mentally handicapped who not. you know actually that 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 is not the, that, that is not how i'm applying that term that i'm saying that without saying right but you know what when you act as though you are mentally damaged to that degree even though you are not you have earned the title retard so no please continue thank you <laughs> <laughs> glad we sorted that one out yeah yes. well well really we've done several shows on this chuck as i was saying and it is now the post-truth world we talked about this didn't we the post-truth world and this document that came out of the british psychological association because all of this stuff is just hiving the population the, the stuff that comes out today, I mean, it's absolutely ridiculous. Slight side issue from the old age pensioners who got targeted by Antifa, one of them knocked to the ground, a 74-year-old peace activist who uh, ironically was trying to get Blair locked up for his war crimes, was pushed to the ground. And right. by these morons with masks on, it doesn't matter whether they call themselves anarchists because they used to be the undercover police, the anarchist lot. And then you've got this, you've got kind of these useful idiots 
who are, who are actually pulling in people who have legitimacy in the public eye. And that's where it gets dangerous. On Sunday, we were talking about this crazy group called Slut Walk. And they have these Slut Walk protests. And obviously, some it was some police officer years ago who'd made, I mean, I mean it, in a way... In, our, in, in the post-truth world, we can find this funny because this guy's made a politically incorrect statement, right, in 2011. Um, it's a, it, you can see that it's in our last show, actually. We covered it in quite some depth. But what he said was that women should be careful and quite moderate in their dress when they go on protest, not to attract too much attention. So, we, we, you know, don't really dress like a slut, right? <laughs> Which is an, in, a politically incorrect thing to say, but it's a kind of amusing blooper, really. It's not really anything that serious, is it? You know, no one's going to get killed over this. But this group started off, of course, Slut Walk. And they were having a uh, face down with a group called the Zioness Movement because Slut Walk were apparently promoting Palestinian rights along with all of the other identity politics that they come. And we've got to remember, Chuck, that this is all about identity politics. It's not about reality. It's about people defining themselves first and foremost as either a race, a belief, or a sexual orientation. Well, yeah. I've never done that. Have you? I don't get this. Why is it all about identity? Because to me, my, my the way that I am is quite. I'm, 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 I, I find that quite boring, to be honest, because it's more interesting um, what we can become. And how we can progress. So we have to go beyond identity politics to even start growing up. And I think that's the point here. What do you think about that? Well, th that's exactly the point. And the reason why, and, and, and I'm so glad you just laid that out, because now I almost feel like I'm, I'm high. Uh, because <laughs> it, it sounds like one of those, you know, sort of convoluted things when you know somebody has, you know, smoked way past their limit and they start explaining something to you and it sounds like that. The problem is you're not high. Uh, you're telling us the real truth of what's happening there. This is not confusing in that you're describing something in a confused manner. It's confusing, though, because uh, how do you get from Palestinian rights to slut walks and slut shaming? The whole thing is so bizarre at this point. And, and that was one of the things I wanted to make real clear on this show with you and, and not to you, with you. OK, uh, it, it's this. They have hijacked with these presented alt this and alt that, okay? They have hijacked anything that they think they can sweep up into it, okay? Which could be a legitimate concern, could be a legitimate point of protest, could be a, a, a legitimate uh, a form of dissent in one way or another, Um Thinking about it in a politically correct and incorrect way at the same time, uh, you know, they've, they've forged these battle lines, which are for the most part fictitious, and decided to pit the real people against each other. And in some cases, yeah, there are useful idiots that are working for the cause, but there are provocateurs and there are people way beyond that old cartoonish anarchist you know that used to show up like the guys who showed up at the 9-11 protest in 2008 in new york city i mean these guys showed up on cue right before the news cameras came they were all wearing the same shoes i mean you know what i'm talking about here and these are the guys who go well we should start you know smashing things and how about we do this and how about we do that trying to steer the crowd that was the infantile version of what's happening now. I think it's a lot more sophisticated. And what they've done is they've created, you know, in, in other words, and what I see constantly is people choosing a side like, look, the entire Antifa thing is evil and wrong and they're all being run by the government. And then people that are sort of, you know, sympathizers with it turn around and go, look, the right wing side of this, the, uh, you know, the alt right guys are all actually government people and they're the provocateurs. And it's just pointing fingers back and forth without realizing that the smartest thing in the world has been done. And that is that both of the most extreme points in this equation are being controlled by the same people. Well, that's exactly I mean, right. I mean, that's what it's all about. That's what we're saying to start with. I mean, we have this ridiculous 
sort of, um, they call them far-right groups over here, which all seem to have Israeli connections, especially oh, the t- Tommy Robinson, who now works for rebel media, the so-called alt-right stroke ultra-Zionist organisation. Um, and that's where that does get interesting. So you've got this idiot called, he calls himself Tommy Robinson, um, which sounds like, sort of, oh, I'm a bloke from Britain. My name's Tommy Robinson. And it's like, no, it's not. You call Stephen Yaxley Lennon anyway, which is kind of Irish. Uh, well, Yaxley is, is kind of Anglo-Saxon, I think, but Lennon is Irish. So right. he's got this double-barreled name. And he gets pictures of himself taken uh, on an Israeli tank in Israel with an IDF shirt on saying I'm a proud Zionist. But wait a minute. I thought you were a, a British nationalist. Well, how does that work? And that's an interesting question and a place well, that most people don't go. But the other well, groups. Well, let me let me let me interrupt you one second here, because here's the here's here's something that I, I want you to help me sort. Mm. Um, there are legitimate, regular, you know, normal sort of people that you, you could say legitimately fall in the conservative or in the right wing category. Well, those are the right? people they're trying to demonize, Chuck, because those are the people who were the middle classes who actually have a conscience. Now, as Yuri Bezmenov, the Soviet defector stated, and we played this, but and people should listen to what he was saying in the 80s because it's all come true. He said the host population have to be willing to be subverted and that's what all of this identity politics and basically global communism under the UN and Antifa is all about and the UN are now involved in telling the United States that they've got to sort out the far right well hang on a minute why are they getting involved in something that's to do with identity politics. Now, they haven't got involved in any of this stuff apart from in nations where there has been a lot of trouble. So what we've got is the United Nations interfering in the politics of the United States on behalf of this terrorist group called Antifa. Now, that's my perspective on that one. Mm. And and that's the thing. There are people that are also legitimately on the, say, seemingly more liberal side, right, that are more concerned with the social issues and yeah, but being sure, fair. One minute, yeah? What I have yeah. to say here, and I don't want to interrupt you again, but I think it's very important to make this point. This word liberal has been completely hijacked. It no longer means what it used to mean because the people using it, and the people that I've experienced who are using this are domestic extremists. They're not liberals. That's right. Yeah. No, that's exactly yeah, right. Sorry, that, sorry, that's sorry. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, that, that's but that's the thing I've been trying to explain to yes. Americans now. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. when they say, well, gee, you know, uh, the Hillary Clinton, she's the liberal. And I'm like, no, she's not. Even in the mainstream, liberalism doesn't exist. Okay? No, that's absolutely right. That's absolutely right. Because old fashioned liberalism was actually quite interesting and where it came from. People should look that up. Where That's right. That's exactly right. Was right. About. What it was about, it was a fairly honourable thing, but it got hijacked because it was the middle ground. And, of course, that the whole, the whole way this has been now co-opted is into an absolute cartoon. It, there is no reality involved in any of this stuff. And all of these terms, far-right, liberal... Um, leftist have all been drained of their meaning because, as I said, we're in the post-truth world. These terms have no meaning. But what we're finding is that this label far right is going to be applied to anybody who's outside this globalist paradigm, this one that's promoted by the likes of Antifa. And we're seeing that in Britain because today it's been stated on the news that Four British soldiers have been arrested. One was actually in Cyprus, three in the UK. They're from the Royal Anglian Regiment. And they were allegedly, now this is interesting, Chuck, right? Allegedly, 
members or allied with a banned far right group. Now, this is where it gets very interesting with the propaganda issue, because this far right group called National Action, I did a show on them called National Action Comedy Nazis, right? Because you've got these guys with masks on, with these sort of runic flags, and they're basically doing this Zieg Heil thing, which doesn't mean anything, right? It's a totally meaningless thing to do. Because when they talk about neo-Nazis, there aren't any Nazis anymore. So these guys are, to me, it looked like it's a setup. Um, this organisation. It was either taken over, and it appears to have been for that purpose, so it could be banned. And people have told me and corrected me. They've, they've tried to correct me. They've said, yes, but it is a real group. I said, no, I'm, I'm not disputing that it's not a real group. I'm saying that it's been steered and used exactly as the English Defence League and this other ridiculous organisation we have here called Britain First. Now, this ties into what I'm going to say, Chuck, because what they've done They've tied these four British soldiers, and here we're very patriotic, like you are there. We all want to support our forces, and they've now labelled them as far-right neo-Nazis. Now, that, to me, is propaganda in a nutshell. What they're going to be doing next is saying people like Windows on the World is a far-right extremist because he holds views which are obviously against the public interest because he's he's saying subversive things on his channel and he's he said that trump's okay where or he said this or he said that or is it which i haven't said trump's okay but they, they make it up anyway so it doesn't matter what you say they're just going to put a spin on it and make it into nonsense but the point is that what they've done is they've they've now combined this kind of thing with the British Army, National Action, which is a banned terror group now. It's the first group that was banned in the UK as being uh, basically a terrorist group. And you've got all these nutcase talking head idiots on the television um, giving their bit on it. And you've got the link, you see, with the Joe Cox murder, because this guy, Thomas Mayer, who we believe, well, I believe he was a complete patsy. I don't believe that this murder happened the way that we are told it did. And we went down to Burstall and the people there were very scared. Thomas Mayer's half-brother, the guy who killed this MP, um, we went to talk to him and the lady who talked to him and to visit him stated that Thomas Mayer's half-brother did believe that Thomas Mayer had been set up a meeting was arranged and this lady was going to go down there and interview him. He never turned up for it. These people are petrified. So it wasn't something I initially wanted to get involved with for that reason, because I didn't think we'd get anywhere and we didn't. But that was an interesting thing that basically it threw doubt on the official story. But that story of that guy who got, well, blamed or patsied for this murder of this British MP, and this British MP was used to demonise people on the so-called right because her death was used to actually fund a group called Hope Not Hate, which we covered. Hope Not Hate are a propaganda organisation in the UK, a bit like the Southern Poverty Law Centre, actually, in America. Very, very similar to that. And it, ironically, it was the Southern Poverty Law Centre who found some documentation from the 90s that Thomas Mayer had bought a manual online which had the uh, plan to construct a weapon in it or a gun. Um, it was it was allegedly from some far-right organisation. He would ordered it online in the 90s. How did the Southern Poverty Law Centre get involved in that? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> you, you know what? You know what's uh, why I'm laughing. Yeah. It's because you know this is like the old, uh, the old. It's the anarchist cookbook. Uh, oh you yes, know, that's right? absolutely right. Yeah, 
Uh, you know, and, and, and the Anarchist Cookbook in reality was published once at one time and then uh, lived on in various forms in an underground uh, fashion and was printed, you know, by people with copy machines and sent around the whole country. Um, but as soon as you were found to have one of these things in your possession, uh, you were automatically uh, uh, guilty of all sorts of heinous planning of uh, terrorist acts against the country. Now, that happened in the 90s here in this country. Uh, at a time when, you know, the uh, the Patriot and the militia movements here, which were not racially charged, OK, at the time. Yes. Uh, were then painted as being completely, you know, just uh, and an, uh, a natural result of the Ku Klux Klan. Now, you know about the history of the Ku Klux Klan, right? Yes. A little. Well, I, I mean, mean, I know a little. I mean. Um, well, let me let me give you let me give yeah, you the reason well, yeah. why I bring it up, uh, because here's the thing. There, there was, uh, you know, you've, you've heard of COINTELPRO. We know what that is. That is a program that, you know, J. Edgar Hoover put into place in order to go after all sorts of subversive groups. Now, today, even we're still dealing with problems from that because the FBI won't release, you know, all the files on all of their informants that were implanted into all these different groups. Right. Um, and, and even taking a look at COINTELPRO cases on actual activists, I mean, individuals who are truly fighting for civil rights in various parts of this country, a lot of their murders remain unsolved or undersolved. Okay, Mark? Um, Today, trying to get the truth out about that 40, 50, 60 years later now, okay, is very difficult. Why? Because every time that we have had access to these files, it turns out that among the most extreme terrorists, okay, uh, in the 1960s and 70s when we saw not not the left-wing terrorists, I'll get to them later, but the most extreme right-wing terrorist organizations that were supposed to be anti-government, and of course the Ku Klux Klan had been formally destroyed uh, as a corporate entity and as an organization at one point. But the death knell for it really came after COINTELPRO because they were so heavily infiltrated and seemingly steered by FBI informants. Of and course, this, yes. this is just a matter of public record at this point. Nobody even bats an eye at it. Now, does that mean that I'm saying that the Ku Klux Klan is not an organization that exists with a hearty and uh, happy membership who are perfectly happy to be involved in that sort of rhetoric? Not at all. I'm not saying that at all. It is a very small organization. Uh, it is not as large as people want to make it sound, and it is not. You've just nailed even, it there, Chuck. You've nailed yes. it there because that's exactly like this national action. There may be 20 or 30 of these people who stand up in the street and give Hitler salutes. And then what happens is MI5 go in and, yes, this is going to be useful. And they just take it over. Now, I heard a story about the Ku Klux Klan. It was originally about a load of people in a small town who were very, very concerned about a corrupt mayor or politician. I'm not quite sure. Maybe you can throw some light on it. And they all put white sheets on so that nobody knew who they were and frightened him out of the town. Is there any merit to that story? Because that's what I've, I've heard. Well, you know what? I do not know the entire origin of the Klan because part of that is still shrouded in mystery. The fact either is that, that you- Chuck, either that I've got an idea. Either it was that they were all dressed in sheets and they modified them or it's an alien cargo cult, right? Because <laughs> it's just so weird. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is weird, but here's here's the thing about the imagery that we know today as the Klan. Um, get ready, get ready for this one, Mark. You're going to love it. There was an organization that was here in the American South that existed and was disbanded. Okay, was disbanded, was declared a terrorist organization, etc. Okay, in this country, and for good reason. They at that time had a larger membership. They were more significant. They were active. They were literally committing acts of violence and they were organic. They were shut down. What happens is somebody wrote a book glorifying the Klan and literally created yes. most of the imagery, including the, the uh, you know, the lighting of the cross. The burning cross itself is yes. not part yes. of the original Ku Klux Klan uh, methodology uh, of their practices, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the sheets, OK, the like almost all of it, in fact, was invented 
in a piece of fiction and yes. then glorified in a movie, which became very popular, which was, you know, distasteful. I mean, it was, you know, sort of like, look at the uh, look at the dangerous, drunk, dark men that are attacking white women. Here come your heroes, the Ku Klux Klan, who they've identified as, you know, great patriots in a movie, in a book. And the imagery was all granted as a work of fiction. Now, does that mean that there are not people today who are getting out in, in woods somewhere in white hoods and lighting crosses? Yes, indeed, they are. The numbers are probably, of course, it's a secret organization, blah, 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 blah. But I believe the numbers when they say that there are likely less than a thousand members to that group. And that is not very significant considering that I'm in a nation where there's over 300, you know, what, 300 million people, okay, and 60% of them are white, and you're telling me that a thousand, okay, of them are involved in this sort of activity spread over something like 20 states. Um, not a huge organization, Mark. I'm sorry, but – then they bring in these other things, which they call neo-Nazis. We had the skinhead thing that went on, which, of course, you guys had in the UK as well. Oh, yes. But we had the skinhead thing that went on in the later 80s, early 90s. What's interesting, that. Chuck, mm -hmm. is that in Britain, the skinheads were actually into West Indian music called Scar. That's what they were interested in. So they were never racist in that respect. It, it was never about racism. It was about that they, they were quite this rebellious group that started – and, I mean, our producer, Tony, probably knows more about it than I do because he's really into that sort of music. But the the whole thing was about ska music. It was about black music. So the skinhead, because there was even a song called Skinhead Moonstomp. And, it, and all of these guys, I still go and see. It's interesting. Um, I'm friends with a, a UK band who actually have a counterpart in the US. They were called the Beat um, I think they're called the English Beat in America. They had quite a lot of hits here in the 80s. And I'm quite friendly with that band. And they have a following in some ways. It's interesting because they started in the 80s and they had a very kind of mixed audience. Came on the end of the punk thing. But you still get a lot of these sort of white middle-aged men with, skit, with, with basically baldies, <laughs> fat baldies following them around. But the, the idea was that skinheads were this racist group and I think they became co-opted as well because I can't see that it was to start with because they were into black music. Well, the weird thing is, right, uh, yeah. we had two we had two forms of them here in the U.S. And we called them either there, there were the Nazi punks, which is what we called them. And, uh, you know, and, and then there were what we called straight edge guys who usually didn't do drugs, uh, didn't drink. Uh, and yes, indeed, the whole reason why slam dancing, apparently, according to legend, got started is because they used to pogo to stuff exactly like ska music. Uh, that was the thing. But then yes, these that was other about guys bouncing around. Yeah. 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 So so yeah. these other guys showed up. And, and what was weird is that uh, they showed up in the heavy metal clubs. And I and I've said on this show many times I was a heavy metal musician and I was also part of, you know, the long haired group. Right. Uh, they used to show up and just, you know, start fist fights with us in the streets and all kinds of craziness. Um, but it was always a totally separate group from the guys I first saw actually shaving their heads, which. You know, seemed really bizarre to me. And, and believe me, I love guys like uh, the Dead Kennedys and you know stuff like that. Mm. I mean, I love I love all that kind of stuff. But, uh, you know, uh, Rollins and all those guys, I mean, uh, wild stuff. I love all kinds of music. But it's fascinating to me that uh, since it's no longer, you know, culturally convenient to uh, to link us all to, uh, you know, the, these little uh, outcoves of uh, you know, compartmentalized uh, a social programming based on the type of music you like, you know, this isn't a great identifying marker any longer. Um, since that's no longer any good, you notice these groups really don't hardly exist, except when it's time to do a protest. I see these guys come out of everywhere. You know, and, and look, we saw that Tiki Torch March uh, that went on, you know, there in Charlottesville. This was very weird to me. Before the violence ever started, I looked at it and I said, something Something is out of place here very badly. I do believe that there was a majority of that crowd that legitimately held those beliefs because they're angry. 
okay, and they don't even know what they're angry at. So they've latched onto this because they think this will form their their sadly uh, deficient identities in their own minds. And I do believe that there is a significant portion of that crowd that's right there. But I, I couldn't believe it when I saw this coming back around again, you know, 25, 30 years after the days when, uh, you know, all of a sudden I had to be engaged in fistfights with uh, with guys who had red suspenders on and Doc Martens, man. I mean, what what is going on? It, it is it is something that is part of the program for sure. And as I said before, I I can't see how anybody doesn't understand that both sides of this are being absolutely propped up, generated and, and created sometimes out of whole cloth. Okay, out of fiction, just like the imagery of the Klan was, just like everything else. It, in, in an organic sense, there is no Antifa and there is no alt-right. It's, it's, like it's a presentation on TV that people just, you know, got carried away with. I mean, that because of those legitimate things that we talked about before, I think, Mark. Uh, where, where is your head on this, though? I mean, I'm just trying to sort it out. Well, I think that you've done a fairly good analogy there. But, yes, people get their information from the media. And so when we see these groups and this Antifa stuff, I mean, these people do exist, but they exist through cultural Marxism. That's where it actually came from. And it comes from... Yeah, basically look at what they watch. I mean, some of these Antifa people I've come across and they watch things like Democracy Now!, which is basically fake liberalism, um, but globalism at the same time. I absolutely deplore what that is about. And these people are heavily brainwashed. And uh, this is why they will just join a protest wherever they want. And it all is down to identity politics. It's about putting the cause or the belief of what you are. And, of course, all this LBGT stuff, which is really hitting the schools here now, it's all about narcissism and identity. And social engineers know all about narcissism because the people that they want to recruit are narcissists because they will go out and do this stuff. People who think about things and who are not egotistical in that sense will actually look back at it. This is what I found because I've come across some of these people who are Antifa thugs and they have attacked what I'm doing and they've attacked people that I know and I know that they've been skewed into something which is brainwashing. But these people are so egotistical and vain and stupid that they think they are carrying out something very noble. And, of course, that's where it all starts and ends, really. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, we can get into the details. I mean, like, this, the Calgary police apparently put this thing out, right? And it says, signs of a child being part of a hate group. If your child is involved in a hate group, these early warning signs may be a clue. One, now, this, some of this is funny, right? A sudden lack of interest in school. <laughs> I mean, I I had never had any interest in school whatsoever. So that would have been, so number one would have, you know, that that would have been drawn to their attention straight away. Well, that's that's almost like adopting new groups of friends and staying out late without any explanation. (laughs) Mark, wait a second. Uh, I mean, number um, I mean, doesn't every teenager. Number one and two. Uh, you might as well say the first sign of a child being part of a hate group is a child being a child, number one. And uh, number two is a child being, oh, I don't know, a child and uh, possibly being a teenager. OK, so what, what is number three? Uh, oh, I hope I haven't lost Mark somehow. I, I, I got to tell you, th- th- this was very amusing. Uh, I'm not hearing you, Mark. If you're hearing me, you might be muted or something, but. I'm 
I'm highly amused. I, I love seeing these lists of warning signs and indicators for, you know, your your kids might be using drugs if they are. And, and it's so funny because you look at it and you go, well, is every kid on drugs? Well, maybe if you're taking them to their pediatricians and they're prescribing them uh, SSRIs. But outside of that, not every kid is taking drugs and not every kid is part of a hate group that decides they don't like school or, uh, you know, maybe staying out a little too late or trying to uh, push the boundaries of the rules of the house. Gee, that might be a sign of terrorism coming up. Oh, did I use the T word? I did. Mark, um, <laughs> that's just too much. And and these, I, I can't get him back on sound wise, but I got to tell you guys, it, it, it's, it's too funny. I mean, it reminds me. A couple of years back, I do recall, uh, we, we got a couple of documents out of various law enforcement agencies, uh, basically brought forth by police officers and individuals that were in law enforcement administration that uh, that showed these little guides that were m- mainly sent out to like laptops that were being installed into the uh, police cruisers in the U.S. But in some cases, they were in paper form, literally handed out, uh, you know, to the uh, to the steroid express police here that were being amped up militarily and uh, they said things like you know kids wearing jeans that don't seem to uh, fit in a normal fashion they might be considered highly dangerous Uh, kids who wear baggy shirts uh, you know, th- this this means that they are likely uh, concealing a weapon Um, I'm looking over this stuff and I'm going this is every punk kid I see everywhere. So are we to determine that every kid with a chip on his shoulder, an attitude problem, or uh, even who happens to have his head up and is trying to even remotely dress like his classmates or his uh, friends in the neighborhood or whatever, are we to assume that they are all terrorists, dangerous individuals, criminals in the making, and in fact armed and ready to go at all times? Are we supposed to be afraid of the children. Yeah, that that was the kind of question that I was asking and I still haven't gotten Mark back, but it's interesting that uh that this is the kind of thing that comes out of a, I think he said uh, Calgary. So the Canadians are catching up in our paranoia. Well, I think I demonstrated that actually not long ago. They're 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 catching up in this uh, twisted cycle of uh of paranoid reactionaryism, right? And uh what we need to do Quite honestly, let's kind of put the whole ball of wax together and melt. No problem. I'm I'm gonna put the ball of wax together and then I'm gonna hand it back to Mark Windows here. <laughs> right. I don't know what happened, there, Chuck, because I was waffling on um, and giving you all these reasons why ch- that children could be part of a hate group, and everything just disappeared. And I was just talking to myself. Yes, I, I, I noticed that. I tried to fill in and hoped you were going to come back. But look, here, here's here's where we're going to go, because we got through a part one and part two. And I was trying to stop you and say, Mark, wait a second. Uh, that to me sounds like every kid. And then I made that point a little stronger while you were gone. Um, but but here's the thing. Let's let's go to number three here, because I, I'm, I'm trying to sort out in my brain if this is any different from what we read a few years ago regarding, you know, if the kids jeans don't fit right. Well, they're probably some sort of criminal if they have a baggy shirt they're concealing a weapon they're all terrorists in one way or another these things were handed out to police officers in america across the country yeah. uh you know literally as warning signs be afraid of the children they're very dangerous uh and you know what in some cities they are um, but for the most part you know you, you don't need to be afraid in your neighborhoods and you don't need to be filled with fear over the dress style and the fact that what teenage boys have chips on their shoulders welcome to to planet earth um exactly so mark let's go back to (laughs) number three here because you were saying this came out of calgary and uh the first two were great they might as well just said you know the first danger sign for kids being dangerous is that they are kids number one and number two by the way they're kids so and they may also possibly be teenagers um but let's move on and go to number three mark (laughs) well it says violence or secretive behavior now that's a bit hard to define, isn't it? Because a lot of kids, especially boys, they have fights and stuff like that. Secretive behaviour, that generally comes from the fact that when you're growing up, you think, oh, my parents, I don't want them to find um, 
you know, this this porno mag or this uh, little bit of dope or this uh, couple of beers that I've managed to sneak in. Do you know what I mean? It's a, This is what teenagers are like. So it's, well, you also, it's you, also, really. you also don't generally go and tell, you know, mom and dad about the fact that you did get to cop a feel off of uh, Sarah What's-Her-Name or whatever over behind <laughs> exactly. the 7-Eleven. I mean, you know, so there is some secretive behavior that goes in there, some of it because of embarrassment and some of yeah, it because... Yeah, I think this raises a big issue, Chuck, because it's about... <laughs> Um, people self-monitoring. And also what we find now is that the Citizen Spy program that's basically upon us and, of course, you, in that children routinely snitch on their parents now to the authorities. Oh, yes. And that is absolutely, I think, what this is about. Um, so they're basically, you see, the children have to be owned by the state and that is the global action plan. So they have to divide them from the parents. And we see. Well, and you, and you've got to train them, and you've got to train them to be full fledged, uh, you know, citizens in the snitch society ever after as absolutely. well. Absolutely. So, yeah, absolutely, Mark. So, was there any other points to this uh, pointless I'd like document? I'd outline one, Chuck, <laughs> because I think you might laugh at this, and okay. so might I. We're having a similar background. I mean, I was often into bands like Black Sabbath when I was a kid, you know, at 13, 14. It didn't make me violent. I just thought some of their stuff was quite mystical in some ways, actually, Sabotage being a good album, side issue. But um, it says... My, my favourite, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we'll have to talk about that. Was a, playing loud, heavy music with violent lyrics. Now, wait a minute. The, the whole of the music business has been taken over now by heavy music with violent lyrics, right? So it's hard not to grow up as a teenager and not experience heavy music with violent lyrics. I, I don't really understand how they can even put that one in. But, of course, it all helps with the divide and rule nonsense. It says here, <laughs> stereotyping and scapegoating of certain groups, name-calling. Well, name-calling is just what all kids do, don't they? But then they bring it into racial and religious slurs in conversation at all times. Now, we're living in such a politically correct age that I don't think even those things happen very much now. They happened very much when I was a kid, and I, I was very much aware of it even then that some of this stuff was extreme, you know. But now, that doesn't make any sense. Like, yes, they go, oh, making racist or bigoted. Now, bigoted has become the the word that all of these Antifa use, use against anybody that they don't like. They call them bigoted. And I've begun to hate that word because I've associated with that, that group, you know. <laughs> they uh. always use that word, bigoted. You know. Well, you know, and, and, and I mentioned to somebody, I, I was a guest on a radio show uh, last week, and somebody said, somebody called me a name. And, uh, and, and you know, they were just angry with me, and they spurted out some name. And, oh, I'm so sorry they called you a name. I said, I said, I, you know what, I'm from the northeast of the United States. Um, this is one of our favorite pastimes is to call each other names. I'm not affected. You know, <laughs> it doesn't. Yes. This, and, and as a child, even worse, we sat there and said probably some of the most horrific things that uh, some of these Antifa people would probably want to beat us to death for. Oh, yes, to people. that's the funny thing, though, because when we were at school, I mean, it was just normal to hurl abuse at people. That was normal. And and it's not nice. It isn't when you're a teenager because everyone's sensitive about something, you know, especially right. when you're growing up. But, I mean, it's just ridiculous because the childish mind will just pick up on anything that's not the same as them, that's well, different right. to them, and and have a go at it. So Look, with, with, without even without even being you know dirty or politically incorrect, how about this? <laughs> you, you, I mean, you could just imagine. Just here we go. Picture in your mind: one kid is standing in a room, another kid walks in, the other one looks at him and says, uh, "You know, hey." You really should trade in that face. I think it's time for a new one. Um, it's got nothing to do with anything, but this is the kind of thing that we do. And that was the cleanest thing I could think of right there, by the way, off the top of my head. This is what we do as adolescents. We're abusive to one another. It's a rite of passage. I, I Look, 
<laughs> well, it you know, goes. Not, they, I mean, it's and, just, and believe me, I'm I mean, not saying that humor, bullying. Yeah. Yeah, but it, it, this is humorous, and I'm not saying that bullying is a good thing, and I'm not saying that you know we should encourage that behavior. But you got to know that that's part of the equation. I mean, they're trying to literally take all that out as well. And to me, that's character building. I know that's oh so incorrect to say, but it actually builds character. You know, people are going to say cruel things to you that actually have some meaning at some point in your life, and it's going to be you know what doesn't matter what you happen to need since you can't afford the medical treatment you're going to die anyway you better be prepared okay and if uh you know somebody breaking your chops over your face when you're a teenager is going to destroy you you need to adjust okay um that's the truth of it and that's why i don't even object to all of it but anyway that's me mark we're almost out of time and i want to give you the final words on this but i'm so glad that we broke it down to this kind of stuff right here and now because this needs to be said somewhere <laughs> i am glad it's being said here go ahead well uh, we haven't even got onto north korea chuck but the point is that that's a huge distraction issue as well because the war in syria is won by the syrians they've kicked out isis and what the north korea distraction issue is all about is saving face, and they're the usual bogeyman, aren't they? And that is totally ridiculous. But what I would say about what we've been talking about tonight is that people really need to be aware that we are in the post-truth world. We are in an age of absolute media manipulation to an extent that's never happened before. Now, it has always happened, but not to this extent. Now, all this stuff that's coming up with this uh, kind of neo-Nazi, um, this th- this far-right stuff, we've covered it for weeks and weeks and weeks on end. You go to windowsontheworld.net, have a look at what we've done. We've taken apart a lot of this stuff uh, from a British perspective, um, and it's a global action plan implemented locally. And when they are bringing in the British forces and saying that the British forces are allegedly part of a far right group, we know where this is going. They're demonizing anybody who is out of this globalist communist paradigm. And that's all I've got to say on it, really, because we've run out of time. But there's a lot more that we can go into on this in great detail. And I look forward to doing it at a future date, Chuck. No, absolutely. And if you don't already know, go to windowsontheworld.net. Yes, indeed, it does sound like a restaurant at the top of a formerly tall building that did exist here in the United States at one point in time. But uh, no, it's not that. It is Mark Windows' website. A lot of great information there. And I know for a fact you've been doing these uh, radio shows on it and you've done some interesting videos lately. I urge everybody to go check them out. And the only message I have for everybody who is hearing the sound of my voice right now is is please think for yourselves and don't be the useful idiot for either side of the equation, no matter how your sympathies really come down. You never know. One of these days we might get back to that classic liberalism. We might get back to that classic sort of, you know, nationalism where it's not about uh, being destructive and being a useful idiot for somebody else's agenda. We might actually get back to, oh, I don't know, the old days of having legitimate arguments but not if those who are in power have anything to do with it because this is their game and uh, if you're going to play it don't pick a side unless it's your own what do you think Mark? Basically the post truth world that is what we're in and that's absolutely, what Mark, the and media. absolutely yeah. Mark and that is the end of the hour we'll be back next with Larry Wood stay tuned Join me, Mark Windows, with Tony Hurst for Windows on the World Live every Sunday, 9 to 11 p.m. GMT at autonomousmedia.net.